Cross it. Hey everybody, Dr. O here. Welcome to chapter 12, <clears throat> excuse me, on water and the major minerals. So, um, this is like a few of the other chapters where I will cover it in, in really good detail, but if you want to go one step further, I already have a whole video series on fluid and electrolyte balance, So, and, and your electrolytes are going to be some of the major minerals we talk about today, like um, sodium, potassium, magnesium, etc. So I've gone uh, into great detail on why we need water and how we maintain fluid balance and then how we maintain electrolyte balance uh, in other places. So I'll cover a lot of ground here, but I will be sharing in the course. I'll be sharing extra re resources with you. And if you're not in the course, then just uh, look for the, the fluid, electrolyte, and acid base balance um, um, playlist. Okay, so let's dive in. So we're talking talking about water and the minerals. You know, the, fir the first thing I think about is their relationship, right? So we, we know we need water, right? We're basically a, a bag of water. The, the 50 to 70% of our body is water depending on lean mass. So the number one ingredient to make a human being is water. Um, but, so we'll talk about fluid balance, which is balancing your water gains with your water losses. We'll talk about ways to know if you're doing that. But um, the electrolyte balance is critically important as well because, yeah, how much you drink versus how much you pee and how much you sweat, that will determine how much water is in your body. But the electrolytes you consume will determine where the water is. So we'll talk about how much water you should have, where it should be, and then how we can influence that by, for example, e uh, eating less sodium and more potassium, those types of things. Okay, so water, I mean, water is just is critically, critically important. So we'll, we'll go through all those details there. I also want to give you some hints for to know maybe how much water you should be consuming in a day and, and should you be using electrolyte drinks or should you just be drinking water? Well, we'll talk about those things. That'll also tie into chapter 14 on sports performance as well. Okay, so what is your beverage of choice? What does that beverage do to maintain your body's fluid balance? So obviously there's lots of things we can drink. Um, wa you know, water is generally generally your best bet, but there, there are other beverages that are good, right? The only real downside with most other beverages is they are calorie containing. So if you're, if you're trying to limit your calorie intake because you're trying to lose weight or you're struggling to maintain weight, one of the first things I would tell you to do is to, is to stop drinking your calories because, um, you know, if, if you drink a, a couple of hundred calories, um, you get a couple of hundred calories, but uh, not much satiety for, at all comes from that, not the, the feeling of fullness, right? So, um, um, so that's generally one thing that, that, to keep in mind, but there are tons of beverages that are really good for you. So here we see milk, you know, uh, milk could be a, is a really good source of calcium. It's a good source of protein. Uh, the, you know, the, the, you can turn milk into other things like you see there. Uh, <clears throat> coffee, coffee is my kind of life support in the morning. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's as good as water, but what one, uh, so of course, mo the majority of what I drink in the, is water and I'll kind of talk about when I drink it as well. I'm actually a really big fan of drinking most of, most of my liquids, most of my water between meals. So we'll talk about that. So, you know, usually in the first thing in the morning, I will consume a couple of big glasses of water and then I like to consume quite a bit of water between meals. But uh, I do have some, some coffee and other beverages. Um, one thing about coffee is it kind of has a bad reputation as being a diuretic and, and it is but it still leads to a net gain in fluid balance. So let's say, you know, so water, it, let's say you drink eight ounces of, of coffee. Well, um, even, even if coffee still has a relatively powerful diuretic effect on you, you're still going to be getting a net gain of maybe four ounces of water. But uh, you can go to, I've looked at WebMD, I've looked at the Mayo Clinic's website, they talk about these things. Coffee is a diuretic when you first get, when you first start consuming it, but your body adapts and your body gets used to things um, to the point where, you know, once you're adapted to consuming coffee, it's it's really not much of a diuretic and there still is a net gain of water. So maybe I'm just defending my coffee habits and that, that I can do a whole separate video on coffee at some point because it has powerful antioxidants. It increases autophagy. Uh, most observational studies actually show that heavy coffee drinkers are, are healthier than people that don't consume coffee, mainly because people that don't consume coffee are probably more likely to be consuming soda and things like that. All right, so that's, so coffee's my beverage of choice, but but truly water is still the majority of what I drink and what the majority of what anyone should drink. And that's why if somebody asks me, you know, should I, uh, you know, I want to stop drinking uh, or I uh, should I be drinking diet soda or should I be drinking juice or should I be drinking this or that? The question is really instead of what, right? If someone says, um, should I switch from drinking Coke to Diet Coke? Well, the best thing to do is to switch from drinking Coke to water, but switching from Coke to Diet Coke might be the might be a really great um, stepping point for you. So long, long discussion, lots of nuance like everything else in nutrition. 
All right, uh, you think about that for yourself. So in this chapter, explain how the body regulates fluid balance, uh, list some of the ways minerals differ from vitamins and other nutrients. We've talked about that some in our vitamin chapters and in chapter one, but we'll do it again here. Identify the main roles, deficiency symptoms, and food sources for each of the major minerals, which are sodium, chloride, potassium, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, and sulfate. So major minerals, you see, it has to do with how much you need in a day and how much is in your body. So we have major minerals and trace minerals, just like we had we had water-soluble vitamins and fat-soluble vitamins, the two categories of vitamins. We have two categories of minerals, but the, the main difference here is that um, major minerals, you need you need at least 100 milligrams a day of them and, and some quite more, and there's a large pool of them in your body, or at least there's quite a bit more than compared to the trace minerals. Trace minerals, you need less than 100 milligrams a day, and there's less in your body. So for, uh, or really, we're just talking about, yeah, so you look at like um, iron, for example, super, super important, but you only need, you know, 14, 16, 18 milligrams of it a day, whereas calcium, you should be looking at getting uh, 1,000 milligrams, give or take, a day. So that's going to be the major difference. It's amounts, not importance, when it comes to major versus trace minerals. We'll cover the trace minerals in the next chapter. All right, water and your body fluids. Let's dive in. So water constitutes about 60% of an adult's body weight. I mentioned earlier 50 to 70% depending on lean mass. So if you, uh, if you have less muscle mass and more body fat, you'll be closer to the 50% range. If you have more muscle and less body fat, you'll be closer to the 70%, but 60% is a fine number. So that means you're close to, close to two thirds water. So you see it's higher in children because of their, their, their size distribution and less, it's usually lower in females and lower in the elderly because of less mass. So again, a female with more, uh, or less lean mass, sorry. A female with uh, more lean mass would have more water. So it's not just a, a typical female compared to a typical male. All right, carries nutrients and waste. There's just a long list of functions, right? I like to call, I like to call these the life-giving properties of water. It's something we cover when we look at the basic biochemistry of water, but um, um, water has these special bonds, you know, called hydrogen bonds that make it behave really oddly, right? If you look at, if you look at the, the formula for water, its structure and its weight, um, it, it should boil at a much lower temperature and it, it, it should be different than it is. But these hydrogen bonds give water what I like to call the life-giving properties. And that's because if water didn't behave like water, then life wouldn't be here, right? We just, just a few examples. Um, hydrogen bonds are what allow water to be carried against gravity in plants. So if we, um, you know, if, you, if, we, if we didn't have moisture evaporating or transpiring out of leaves, then we wouldn't have water being pulled up tree trunks or being pulled up plants, and, and we wouldn't have plants that were off of the ground. Um, when uh, one of the biggest ones, we'll call we'll talk about water as the universal solvent, but one of my favorite ones is the fact that ice floats. Like how weird is that, that a solid is less dense than a liquid? So what happens is if you watch water freeze, it starts to shrink and then these hydrogen bonds cause it to swell. So, uh, so solid water or ice is less dense than liquid water, water. So why does that matter? So who cares if your, your ice cubes float in the top of your, your drink or not? Well, the key there is, since water floats, it freezes from the top down. So during the winter, our bodies of water freeze from the top down, and that actually insulates uh, the water underneath it and protects all the things that are living there. If water didn't do that, if water froze from the bottom up, then we would not have aquatic, aquatic ecosystems and, and food webs and, and life really wouldn't exist. So that's, you know, think about like if, you, if our oceans were to freeze, right? It, it's a, uh, you know, just that, that's one of the, a, a big, big no-no. Um, water also just, it can transport heat in ways that you wouldn't expect. I mean, look at how hard it is to get that water to boil when you want to make some mac and cheese or something. You have to pour a ton of energy into water to break all those hydrogen bonds in order to turn it into to steam, to start to, to start to get water to boil. So that means that, you know, think about our, our planet is what, two-thirds water, give or take, and um, 70% really. And um, it, it, this water absorbs a bunch of heat during the summer so it doesn't get too hot. And then it releases heat during the winter so it doesn't get too cold. Right? Imagine if the temperature range on the planet was from 200 degrees to minus 200 degrees. Clearly not compatible with life, which again is why I call them the life-giving properties of water. If water wasn't so special, then life wouldn't exist. And that's why you look at, um, you know, we, when we're looking at other planets, we're looking for signs of life. What are we really looking for? Like on Mars, we talk about, oh, it looks like there used to be water there, which is why we think that life could have existed there. These, these types of things. All right, so what are some other things water does? 
So it carries nutrients and waste products. Anything in your body that is water soluble can be dissolved in water. That's why they're, that's why it's called water soluble. Uh, so water is the main way that we transport um, nutrients and waste products, and that's why most of your blood, you know, about 92% of your blood is going to be water. That's going to be the plasma in your blood, and that's that's what carries things to and fro. Um, helps maintain the structure of large molecules participates in metabolic reactions. We've talked a ton about condensation reactions, how you remove water when you build substances, and hydrolysis reactions, how you use water to split larger things apart. Um, serves as a solvent. Water is called the universal solvent. So in, in living things like us, water is the solvent. So what is a solvent? Um, a, a solvent is a dissolving su substance. It allows other things to be dissolved in it. So that, that's how we carry nutrients and waste products. So you look at a solution. A solution is one solvent, which in this case is water, plus one or more solutes. So I always use Kool-Aid as the example, right? So if Kool-Aid is a solution, then the, the solvent is water because it's in the highest amount, right? You don't chew your Kool-Aid. So the, the solvent is water. The solutes would be the Kool-Aid powder from the packet and the sugar. Those would be the, the solutes. Well, your body is just one big solution and water is the universal solvent. Things that can't be carried directly in water that because they're made of oil or lipids, remember oil and water don't mix, um, they're going to be carried on transporters. So like the cholesterol we talked about a couple chapters ago is carried on LDL, the low density lipoprotein, and or you know HDL, high density. Those are a couple of examples. Okay, acts as a lubricant and a cushion. So you know, think about water lubricating your joints and cushioning parts of your body. Um, aids in the regulation of body temperature. So we think of you know your skin and your blood is basically like a radiator system. It can store heat when it gets cold around you, and it can release heat when it gets hot around you. So so it's a, it's a major major player there, and maintains blood volume. So if you're if you're losing water, then that will affect your blood volume, which is why if you get severely dehydrated, it can cause your blood pressure to go down, your blood volume to go down, your heart rate to go up, all these all these scary things. All right. So the distribution and movement of body fluids. So we talked about how you are made of 60% water, give or take, but where is it? Uh, so we have the fluid inside our cells. You see there it's called intracellular fluid is the fluid inside your cells. See it labeled there in the yellow cell. Um, we are about, about two thirds of our body water should be inside our cells. And we'll talk about how it stays there. Then we have uh, interstitial fluid is the fluid that's between your cells. So if we have, so that's going to be, uh, so all the fluid that's between our individual cells is called interstitial fluid. That's the fluid that becomes like um, lymphatic fluid and those kind of things in the human body. Then we have extracellular fluid, which is all the fluid outside of your cells. So that's going to be about one third of your body water. And then a category of extracellular fluid is going to be intravascular fluid, the fluid inside your or within your blood vessels. So you see here, blood plasma it, or intravascular fluid is an example of an extracellular fluid, and so is interstitial fluid, the fluid between your cells. So just a quick reminder of how important this stuff is clinically. If you have too little blood plasma, then your blood volume and blood pressure will go down. If you have too much blood plasma, your blood volume and blood pressure will go up. So, so where your body water is can, can determine blood pressure. And that's why you'll see that diets that are designed to lower blood pressure actually move where our body water is. We'll cover that later. And then if you have uh, too much interstitial fluid, that's edema. So maybe you eat a salty meal, you eat pretzels or something. Maybe your face uh, puffs up. Maybe your ring doesn't fit right. Maybe your ankles swell. That's edema. That's you're collecting too much interstitial fluid. And that can be caused by lots of clinical conditions. Okay. Some basic terminology there. So now we're talking about electrolyte balance, which electrolyte balance is, you'll, you'll see that we have ele electrolytes that are supposed to be inside our cells and outside of our cells. And that's very important because we really can't control where water, water goes in our body. We can just, just control how much there is. The electrolytes you consume will either drive water into your cells or drive water outside of your cells. And that's why the amount of these electrolytes that you consume is super important. All right, and that's because that first point there, electrolytes attract water. So if we want to move water, we change the number of electrolytes in a, in a, in a solution, in this case us, and that will shift water, hopefully the direction we want it to go. But most of us consume diets that shift water the wrong direction. Just a real quick example, and we'll cover it in more detail. Most people consume too much sodium, which you see here outside the cells, too little magnesium, and too little potassium. So what's the problem with that? Well, if two thirds of our body water is supposed to be inside of our cells, 
but we're not consuming the electrolytes that would suck water into the cells while we're consuming too much water, uh, electrolyte that sucks water out of the cells, then we will have less intracellular fluid and more extracellular fluid, which is why that diet, a diet low in potassium and magnesium and high in sodium, would lead to increased blood volume and high blood pressure, which you know almost the majority of adult uh, American adults have. And then it would also lead to more, more interstitial fluid, so more edema. So, it, so basically, hypertension, one of the most important things to deal with uh, as far as you know, keeping yourself healthy. And the, the amount of these electrolytes you consume is a major player. So we'll come back to that. All right, the electrolytes that are predominantly outside the cell are sodium, chloride, and calcium. The electrolytes, excuse me, that are predominantly inside the cell are potassium, magnesium, phosphate, and sulfate. And like with the vitamins and the, and the other minerals, we won't we won't talk about all these equally because some of them, like phosphates, it's super super important. But if you're eating uh, protein, then you, we don't have to worry about it. Uh, same thing with really the sulfur-based compounds. So um, we'll, we'll mainly focus on the ones that are harder to get. And and I would you know make an argument that magnesium is one of the hardest nutrients to find uh, for someone eating a typical diet. All right, uh, cell membranes are selectively permeable, which that's the, the definition of osmosis, is the movement of water across a selectively permeable membrane. So it allows the passage of some molecules. That's where you see like the, the pota you know, potassium, calcium, these kind of things. They should stay where they are, inside or outside the cells. So since they're not moving much, um, water is going to move instead. And that's why you control where your body water is by which electrolytes you're consuming. Oh, a term here we didn't talk about yet. Um, notice that the green ones are called cations, and the or is that orange? Orange ones are called anions. So cations are positive ions, and they'd be on they'd be on the left hand side of the periodic table, and anions are negative ions, and they'd be on the right hand side of the periodic table. All right, we talked about this. Water dissolves salts and follows electrolytes. We covered those two things. Remember, water is a dissolving substance. That's what makes it an electrolyte. Or sorry, that's what makes it the solvent. And then uh, we talked we talked about how the electrolytes you consume will draw water towards them. So negatively charged electrons are near the oxygen atom. You see that here, and that's the whole thing about these these dipole dipole, dipole interactions. So there's um, there's going to be more electrons on the oxygen side of a water molecule than on the hydrogen side, and that's that's why that you have a, a partial negative charge. So you, so you see more of these negative electrons on one side, um, less on the other. So the negatively charged electrons that bond the hydrogens to the oxygen spend most of their time near the oxygen atom. We just said that. As a result, the oxygen is slightly negative and the hydrogens are slightly positive. So there are these, yeah, these dipole-dipole interactions there. Um, water molecules are attracted to both anions and cations, whether, so whether they're positive or negative ions. So you see there that the sodium and the chloride that's in that picture, which would come from table salt, they both attract water. And then protein attracts water too. That's really important when you look at um, maintaining your blood plasma. So basically water is, water is filtered out of your capillaries, out of your blood uh, by hydrostatic pressure, kind of like a soaker hose. And then um, protein and electrolytes suck the water back in. So we should filter out somewhere in the neighborhood of 24 liters of fluid a day. We should reabsorb 20.4 of those liters if you have enough protein and electrolytes. The other, the, the other 3.6 liters right, uh, becomes lymphatic fluid or lymph, and then it's carried back to your heart. So in the end, at the end of the day, you, shouldn't, you, you should be um, collecting all the water that you filtered out of your blood. If you don't, then you're going to have more filtration and less reabsorption, and you will have edema. You'll have fluid accumulating. An example of that would be someone with liver failure or someone that's very protein malnourished, so they don't have the amino acids that they need to make these proteins. Um, they would develop ascites. They'd accumulate like that. Um, they'd accumulate fluid around their abdomen. Okay, in an electrolyte solution, water molecules are attracted to both anions and cations. Notice that the negative oxygen atoms of the water molecules are drawn to the sodium cation, the positive one, whereas the positive hydrogen atoms of the water molecules are drawn to the chloride. So you see there the, uh, look at the difference there. Sodium's got oxygen attracted to it, the oxygen end of water anyway is attracted to it, and chloride's got the hydrogen end of water attracted to it, just like magnets. Opposites attract. The po positive ions attract negative electrons. Negative ions attract a positive charge. 
Okay, regulation of fluid balance, another topic that I've covered in great detail uh, on, on the YouTube channel. We have uh, the hormones that are involved in fluid balance. So you'll see here antidiuretic hormone, and we'll talk also about the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So hormones play a, a major role in regulating how much body water you have. So the first one is called antidiuretic hormone. It is actually produced by the hypothalamus. It is stored in the posterior pituitary gland, and like its name implies, is an antidiuretic. A diuretic causes you to lose more body water than you're bringing in. An antidiuretic would do the opposite. So antidiuretic hormone's job is to decrease urine production so that you're reabsorbing more water and you're keeping it inside your body. A uh, good example of when this doesn't work well, um, alcohol shuts off the secretion and the function anyways of ADH, which is why alcohol is a powerful, powerful diuretic. You know, if you if you drink four beers, you're going to pee out a six pack, and that's be, that's how powerful of a diuretic alcohol is. It's because of its impact on antidiuretic hormone. If you didn't have this hormone, um, you would have a condition called diabetes insipidus, and worst case scenario, you'd be producing 27 liters of urine a day without the help of this hormone. So we absolutely rely on it. You do not want to have to produce 27 liters of urine a day. All right, the next one is called renin, and renin um, comes from the kidneys, and it leads to the, uh, this, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system that I just mentioned. So renin is an enzyme released by kidney cells when blood pressure is low. Your kidneys do not tolerate low blood pressure. Your kidneys are a filter, and if, they're, if the blood pressure to the kidneys drops by around 20%, your kidneys will stop filtering, which, would, which is not a good thing. So if, you, if your kidneys sense a drop in blood pressure, one of the main things they will do is release this enzyme called renin. So that causes your kidneys to reabsorb sodium, which will draw water with it. Uh, and then, so you see they're accompanied by water retention. So remember where your electrolytes go, that's where water will follow. That's how osmosis works. So renin causes a direct reabsorption of sodium, which leads to the retention of water, decreasing urine production, and then hopefully keeping your blood volume up and keeping your blood pressure up. I know it's weird to try to think that our body has all these systems to keep our blood pressure up when so many people have hypertension, high blood pressure. Well, for most of human history, that wasn't the major problem, right? A, lo a low blood pressure would have been a bigger concern, but now because of our diet changes and our, and our increases in body fat and our activity changes, um, high blood pressure has become so common. I'm not, I'm not saying that hypertension never existed, but it would have been uh, much more rare. Um, some studies of our hunter-gatherer ancestors show um, estimate that what what would have been considered normal blood pressure in the past may have been something more like 100 over 60. So not saying you should shoot for that target now. I'm just saying that's, a, that's something that's been discussed. Okay, so what's the next thing renin does? Renin hydrolyzes angiotensinogen, which is a, a precursor to angiotensin 1, which is inactive until it's converted to angiotensin 2, and that's going to happen in the lungs. Um, so remember that term, angiotensin, because you need an enzyme called angiotensin converting enzyme to do that. And that's an ACE enzyme. And anyone that's on, almost anyone that's on a blood pressure medication would be taking an ACE inhibitor. So our primary blood pressure medications slow this conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. So they're called ACE inhibitors. Actually, I'd say the majority of people that are on, that have high blood pressure are given a combination of an ACE inhibitor and a mild diuretic. So if you, to get rid of some of the excess fluid. All right. Um, so that switch from angiotensin 1 to 2 stimulates the adrenal glands to release aldosterone. So aldosterone is, uh, is the, the second major fluid balance hormone behind antidiuretic hormone. So it's released by the adrenal glands, the cortex or outside the adrenal glands, and it causes your kidneys to reabsorb sodium, which would then um, pull water with it. So you see there at the end, signals the kidneys to excrete potassium and retain sodium. This whole process does do more things too. Um, angiotensin will directly increase blood pressure by being a vasoconstrictor. Uh, it'll also lead to increased thirst. So you'll be thirstier, so hopefully you'll drink more water. Um, all those things will be happening in the background. All right, in most cases, how should people replace their fluids and electrolytes? Why are drinks with added electrolytes so popular? Do you use them? Why or why not? So you can discuss amongst yourself, I guess. But um, uh, most people should replace their fluids um, with just by drinking regular water most of the time. But I, but I, I often, I will always say that we should not, you know, we should not read whether this sounds like a Gatorade commercial or not. Uh, and I'm not a fan of, uh, you know, Gatorades or those things that have a lot of sugar unless you unless you're training and need them. But uh, you should not 
just replace water. You need to replace sweat, right? And sweat is a combination of water and electrolytes. So I actually may I actually recommend getting some more electrolytes the, the more you're sweating. Now, if you're just if you occasionally are exercising, you're out taking a walk, then water is what you need. But if you're sweating a lot, you can lose up to 3,000 milligrams an hour of sodium uh, in in your sweat, amongst other electrolytes. So uh, I do recommend if you're if you're sweating a lot, you're working outside in a hot, humid environment, you're exercising, uh, you should consider replacing sweat, not just electrolyte or not just water, and that's where some electrolytes will come into play. Now, personally, I have you know um, I don't drink Gatorade or those kind of things, but you, you certainly can. I have um, I add a little bit of salt. I uh, you know I actually have one. I'm sitting here. I like these. This is not an advertisement, but I like these element elementes. Um, I will occasionally use one of them. Oftentimes, I'll just sprinkle a little bit of salt in a couple of my glasses of water throughout the day. Uh, I'll make sure I'm getting my electrolytes like potassium and magnesium from my diet. So you just you want to make sure you're getting electrolytes somewhere. They don't have to come from beverages though. If you're getting them in your diet and other places, and you're getting enough to replace your losses from from sweating, then you're good. So most of the time, water is the way to go. All right, most people should replace their fluids by consuming plain cool water and by eating regular fluids. So, so again, you're getting your electrolytes, but just from your food and not from a beverage. In some cases, a solution of sugar, salt, and water is needed. That's basically Gatorade, Pedialyte, those kind of things, much like what is found in drinks that contain electrolytes. What I like about these, these types of things, uh, nothing, not, again, nothing magical about that one, or just adding electrolytes to your drinks. I've also used things called fasting drops. What I like about those is you can get the electrolytes and you can get the water without, without the sugar. All right. Um, so the nephron, this is the functional unit of the kidney. I won't go through all the details here. I've covered, I have an entire uh, playlist on, on the urinary system that covers all the stuff into great, great detail. But basically, your kidneys are a massive filter. Your filters, your, your kidneys are going to filter 50 gallons of fluid every day. And as that 50 gallons of fluid is filtered into your nephrons, your body will reabsorb what you want to keep, like the glucose and the amino acids and these kind of things, will reabsorb the majority of the water, the rest of it becoming urine, and then also will secrete things into the nephrons you want to get rid of, like drugs and toxins and, and metabolic waste products. So the main reason we have kidneys and it is because it filters your blood, right? So urine is basically filtered blood. We have waste products like urea that we have to get rid of because of uh, what our, our body's needs for protein and getting rid of the ammonia or the, the nitrogen from the protein. We have a waste product called creatinine, which is a, a waste product of muscle metabolism. Um, we have to get rid of uric acid from, from the digestion of, of purines and things like that. So we have these metabolic waste products that would kill us if we didn't, if we didn't filter it out. And that's why if your kidneys don't work, then you have to undergo dialysis, which is basically using an artificial kidney. All right. Um, so you see here, uh, number one, blood flows into the glomerulus, which is just this um, knot of capillaries with a cup that catches the filtrate. Blood flows into the glomerulus. Um, some, some of its fluid with dissolved substances is absorbed in the tubules. That's that 50 gallons I talked about earlier becomes tubular fluid. Uh, let's see here. Number two, the fluid and substances needed by the body are returned to the blood, ves blood and vessels alongside the tubule. Number three, the tubule passes waste materials to the bladder. So we, so we filter good and bad stuff into the tubules. We reabsorb the good stuff, we leave the bad stuff, and that's how we get rid of it. All right, the cleansing of blood in the nephron is roughly analogous to the way you might clean out your car. First, you remove all your possessions and trash so that the car can be vacuumed. Then you put back in the car what you want to keep, and then you throw away the trash. So we get all, both good and bad comes out, good comes back in, bad stays out. Excuse me. All right. Got a little coffee on my leg there. All right. So fluids and electrolyte imbalances. So here we see we've actually covered this picture on the right, but uh, uh, so we'll, we'll look at the, this is where how much water you take in versus out is fluid balance. Electrolyte imbalances are what will, what will impact where our water is. Okay. Let's look at the picture on the right first because we've already walked through it and then I'll say a few things on the left. So if we have low blood volume and low blood pressure, that's going to trigger that enzyme renin being released from the kidneys, which converts angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1, which is then converted using ACE or angiotensin converting enzyme into angiotensin 2 in the lungs. And that's going to cause vasoconstriction. I mentioned that, which would 
it makes the pipe smaller so the pressure would go up. It also leads to the release of antidiuretic hormone, which, which opens water channels in the kidneys, so you reabsorb more water. Uh, you see there retains water and thereby retains sodium and excreted potassium. And then also you increase aldosterone, which comes from the adrenal cortex, and it causes the reabsorption of sodium, which pulls water with it. The downside there is as you retain sodium, you excrete potassium. And we need potassium, and we have a hard time finding it in our diet. And the, all those things would cause your blood volume and blood pressure to go up. So I mentioned this before, but fluid balance, two-thirds of your body water should be inside your cells and one-third outside. And that's what these, you know, these different electrolytes are going to are going to help us deal with. So we'll look at, we'll look at where they should be and the amounts here coming up real soon. Our reflection questions one. You can pause this and try to answer these if you'd like. Regulation of minerals occurs in the GI tract and the kidneys because your kidneys determine which electrolytes to retain and which ones to excrete. Sodium is lost indiscriminately by vomiting and diarrhea. So obviously that you shouldn't normally be dealing with those two things, but you would lose a lot of sodium in those situations. Other causes of fluid and electrolyte imbalances are heavy sweating. That's going to be, you know, typically the, the main way we lose electrolytes. Heavy sweating, burns, and traumatic wounds, but sweating being a big one. And that's why, again, if you ask me how much water should I drink, we have to, we have to look at fluid balance. We, get, we gain water by drinking it, by eating it, and we make it. Our metabolism produces, you know, around one and three quarters cups ballpark of water a day. So we drink some, we eat some, and we make some. We lose water by sweat by breathing it out right you can tell when you go outside when it's cold it looks like you're smoking that's water vapor so we sweat it out we i was gonna say we smoke it out we we breathe we breathe it out um we urinate we and then and then fecal material has some water too even if you if you don't have diarrhea it's a small number but if you do have diarrhea it'd be more so if you ask me how much water should i take in i'm like i need to know how much how much you're eating of it how much i mean are you eating a lot of watery fluids or watery foods like soups and stews or not, um, but I mainly need to know how much are you sweating and how much are you urinating. So those are those are all things that change day by day. So it's really hard to know how much water you should be taking in. But I um, I'll give you my best advice here for how to maintain it. And, and before we move on, uh, the simplest advice I give the typical person: Yes, you have. We'll look at the numbers like half your body weight in ounces or eight glasses of water a day, etc. But I generally recommend asking your body if you're hydrated. So the simplest thing to do is. If you are urinating every two to four hours, so let's say you're urinating every three hours, and your urine is pale yellow, then you are hydrated, right? And there, there are some exceptions, like if you, you know certain drugs and things that would change that. But um, you basically just asking your body, right? If you're producing enough urine that you have to urinate every three hours or so, that means your body's willing to give up excess water. If your urine is pale yellow, same thing. If you're urinating every hour and it's crystal clear, then you're overhydrated. If you're urinating every six hours and it's dark yellow, that means you're dehydrated and your body is only getting rid of the water that it, that it needs to get rid of, right? We would pee dust if we could, but we can't. So we have to, we have to make urine. So the less urine you're making and the darker or more concentrated it is, the more your body's telling you that you're dehydrated. So the simple answer to me is just to let, let your body tell you. All right, acid-base balance, another big, another big thing that goes along with fluid and electrolyte balance is maintaining your body's pH. Um, you see here death on either end of the spectrum. So the, the pH of your blood is normally 7.35 to 7.45. If, if your pH drops too low, you're in an acidosis condition. If it climbs too high, you're in an alkalosis condition. Extremes on either end and you're dead, right? So that just like everything else when it comes to homeostasis. Acidosis conditions are way more common. And, you know, again, we're just going to quickly go through this. I have a whole section on this on the channel, but um, your metabolism generates acid. So every moment you're alive, your body is generating acids, which means that you're teetering on this condition where you're becoming too acidic. Way more common to become too acidic than to become too alkaline or too basic, which I know means something new to you young kids. Um, all right, so um, respiratory acidosis would be caused by breathing too slowly. Uh, metabolic acidosis would be caused by producing too many acids. Um, that can be like ketoacidosis or lactic acidosis. Um, alkalosis, let's see, respiratory alkalosis can be caused by hyperventilating, which again, hyperventilating is way, way less common than someone having a lung disease that's impacting their ability to breathe correctly. Uh, and then metabolic alkalosis is the, the least common. That's usually caused by a whole bunch of, of vomiting. So, because you think about it, your, your stomach is a bowl of acid. If every time you vomit, you pour out that bowl, you have to refill it. So your body will keep using its stores um, to make stomach acid, which would cause the, which you're gonna be using up acids, so the pH would climb. But, but again, I know it's real quick, but the, the point is, 
that um, we use electrolytes, we use these ions to regulate the pH in our body. We have this narrow range where we're healthy, where our blood pH is 7.35 to 7.45. If it, 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 you see here, the problem with your pH getting too high or too low is it denatures proteins. Remember that word, when you denature a protein, you unravel it. The problem is if you unravel a protein, you've changed its shape. If you change its shape, you change its function. So the, so the death would come from organ failure. Your enzymes would basically unravel and your metabolism would shut off. And your cell membranes would get all screwed up. Lots of things. Just don't, don't let it happen. All right. Um, so you see here a high concentration of hydrogen ions makes you acidic. A low concentration of hydrogen ions is basic or makes you alkaline. All right, so one of the ways that we regulate this, now the two big systems that regulate um, your pH are going to be your respiratory system and your urinary system. So your kidneys and your lungs play a major role in maintaining your pH. But your buffers, what they do is they, um, they resist changes to pH. So buffers are needed temporarily um, to neutralize changes in acids or bases until your kidneys and lungs can solve the problem. Uh, so you see here, buffers can neutralize acids or bases. How, the, how they actually work is a buffer can function as a weak acid when you expose it to a base, or it can function as a weak base when you expose it to an acid. So we have lots of buffers in our body fluid, but here's a couple examples. Bicarbonate, very common in your digestive system, uh, and, then, and then carbonic acid, which is what, um, which is what happens when we're, uh, that's how we carry carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide becomes, becomes this weak acid known as carbonic acid, and that's, that's how you carry it. Uh, that's how you carry it uh, in, your, in your blood, basically. Uh, and then your lungs and kidneys play a major role in, in dealing with this over the long term. So, so if someone's having an acid-base disturbance, it's almost always something to do with the lungs or something to do with the kidneys. Our recommended intakes. So let's see here. We have thirst and satiety. Um, I mean, just so if you, you know, drinking when you're thirsty is a pretty good idea. But you see here that thirst response lags behind the body's need for water. That's why I always recommend that you know you, you should just you should constantly be maybe sipping on something. Not constantly, but um, uh, making sure you're getting your water intake, whatever whatever your goal. Let's say you're shooting for half a gallon a day or whatever. Um, just make sure you're constantly having some throughout the day, not just chugging it in the morning and chugging it during meals. Uh, because by the time you're thirsty, um, your body is already sensing some mild dehydration. So I always like to say, drink a little bit before you're thirsty. And you only know that just kind of by practice. And you notice I drink a lot, but because uh, my mouth gets dry and I talk a lot mainly. But um, yeah, so, so thirst, um, if you're getting signals that you're thirsty, you definitely need to be drinking water. But I recommend trying to stay ahead of those thirst signals. You see your link between thirst and satiety. So if you're dehydrated, um, your body will also tell you to eat because we, we can get food or we can get water from our food as well. All right, um, on the flip side, drinking too much, right? Making sure we don't, we don't overdo water. Water intoxication. You see your symptoms are confusion, convulsions, and deaths. You don't hear about this very often, but people do get overhydrated, oftentimes athletes. Uh, the condition is um, called hyponatremic encephalopathy. What that means is the brain will swell because um, there's so much water that you've diluted the sodium, hyponatremia, sodium being Na on the periodic table. Um, so over-consuming water um, can certainly be a problem. You hear about like you know the lady that died um, chugging a bunch of water to win a wee, or you, uh, there was a case about a girl that was forced to drink like three liters of soda or something by her parents and it killed her. Um, so those things can happen. Um, I I have a I had an old roommate who knew a guy that um, that had a, a a psychological condition where he couldn't stop consuming water, like he almost lost his tongue from licking the condensation off of an air conditioner, things like that. So there are these, those are kind of some rare examples. But so what's more common though is someone that's sweating, losing a bunch of water and sodium, and then only replaces the water. And that's why if you're sweating a lot, I recommend replacing sweat, not just water. So you see, you're caused by drinking 10 to 20 liters within a few hours. That's a pretty big pretty big number, but it does happen occasionally. So that's called water intoxication. So how much do we need? That's the problem. Needs vary. Like I mentioned earlier, if you ask me how much water should I take in, my question is how much water are you losing? And, that, and that's, that's why there is no RDA. You see here there's an AI or an adequate intake because we cannot say how much water you need. If you're a roofer in Texas that's outside sweating in a hot, humid environment you're going, and, and you exercise, you're going to need way more water than someone like me sitting here in the basement in a, in a cool room, et cetera, et cetera. 
So the recommendation here is eight to 12 cups per day. Great place to start. You know, some people would say half your body weight in ounces. At least that takes your size into consideration. But, I, but I've already told you what I recommend, right? Look at your urine, look at how often you're urinating, ask your body if you're, um, if you're drinking enough water. Okay, health effects of water intake, physical and mental performance, they both go up if you're hydrated and down if you're dehydrated. Uh, proper functioning of your organs like kidneys, heart, GI tract, and other systems, they need water. Like just for example, your GI tract needs, I don't know, six or seven liters of water a day to produce all the fluids and, and, and to move all the materials. So, uh, very, and then, you, then your, your kidneys, if your blood volume and blood pressure drop, your kidneys will shut off. Uh, obviously your heart is a pump, it needs something to pump. So those are some good examples. How about the mineral intake in your water? So you have things like hard and soft water. So hard water has more minerals, soft water has less. So if you have, you know, the, uh, um, what else? Like we use culligan, so like the minerals have been removed from our water. So that means that, you know, and I don't think your water is where you should be getting most of your nutritional value as far as minerals go, but keep that in mind, right? If you're drinking a bunch of reverse osmosis water where the minerals have been removed, you are gonna have to consume more um, in your food. All right. And that's why like with the kids and stuff, we, we use fluoride rinses because since we consume culligan water, the fluoride's been removed for our, from our water as well. Fill in the missing words or phrases. So you can pause and try to answer these and we're moving on. Uh, the kidneys are central to regulating blood volume, which in turn influences blood pressure. They do this by adjusting urine volume and concentration. So again, ask your kidneys by asking your urine, and it sounds kind of weird, if your blood volume is good and if your, urine, if your hydration status is good. And your kidneys care so much about this because not only are they, I mean, they are the filters, but they need enough blood pressure to function. It's like if you have a bunch of coffee sitting in your, your coffee maker in your kitchen, but you don't run any water through it, you won't have coffee. All right, antidiuretic hormone is released in response to dehydration. Thus, it stimulates water to be reabsorbed by the kidneys. It opens what are called water channels. If a person is dehydrated, their body releases antidiuretic hormone to conserve water. These events stimulate thirst, we talked about earlier, and then both of these mechanisms help restore blood volume and homeostasis. Okay, that's water. I told you I'd go kind of quick, but there's a lot there's a lot to say about water. So let's now let's cover the major minerals and again we'll cover the trace minerals in the next video. So minerals are inorganic elements. That means that doesn't mean you don't buy them in a farmer's market. It means they don't they're not based on carbon. So the uh, your your vitamins are carbon-based structures that are built in organisms. So they're they're made Inorganic elements, the minerals are not made there, or they were at some point in, in stars, but they're, um, they're elements on the periodic table. So the trace minerals and major minerals are all vital. So calling something a trace mineral doesn't mean it's not important, it just means you don't need very much of it, like something like selenium, for example. Inorganic minerals are not destroyed by heat, air, acid, or mixing. So whether or not they're in your food is determined by whether or not they were in the soil where your food was grown or whether or not they were in the food that the food that you know that they were in the plant food that the animals that you're going to eat ate so minerals are they travel through food webs but they're but they're not destroyed the way that vitamins are um, bioavailability is a big deal so you see there are some things that impact mineral bioavailability really good examples your two best examples really are phytates and oxalates these would be compounds uh, they're called anti-nutrients basically because they're compounds in plants that um, decrease the availability of minerals remember that the minerals that are stored in a plant are there for that plant and, and they're usually for reproduction so um, so like for example in a, in a seed um, the minerals might be locked up by these anti-nutrients and then they're going to be released least um, during certain times in that plant's life. So um, this is where things like sprouting grains or soaking nuts and seeds might actually increase the mineral bioavailability by, um, by causing these anti-nutrients to, to let go of them. So there, um, I mentioned this a few times, but these, these types of anti-nutrients are the reason that, for example, spinach has a ton of calcium. Spinach has as much calcium as a glass of milk, but you're only going to absorb 5% of it. So be, because it's the, 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 the bioavailability is very low. So that's not, you know, that's okay because uh, calorie for calorie uh, vitamin or vegetables and fruit have a lot of nutrients anyway. So you're, you're, you're going to be absorbing less of them, but there's still quite a bit there. All right. Um, Excess of some minerals can create an inadequacy of others. That's another really big thing too. Like if you're um, if you're consuming a uh, 
whole bunch of zinc, for example, will actually will impair the absorption of, of some other minerals like copper. So you do want to try to make sure you're getting, it's the whole diet thing. You want to make sure you have an adequate yet moderate amount of all minerals. If you get a whole bunch of one, like maybe a whole bunch of calcium would impact the absorption of magnesium and vice versa. So you, so you don't, you, you want to make sure you have enough of all your minerals, but not, not really high levels of any of them. And supplements are often to blame. Like I said, if you're taking 1500 milligrams a day of calcium in supplement form, well, that is going to impact how your body absorbs magnesium, for example. Okay. Minerals in a 60 kilogram or 132 pound um, human body. Uh, all right, so there uh, you see here we have the major minerals dealing with how much you have in your body. So you've got uh, calcium and phosphorus are the only two where you have more than a pound of the minerals in your body. Potassium, sulfur, sodium, chloride, and magnesium, you know, having um, the 30 grams there, but still those are, those are all considered major minerals. The, the key is how much you need in a day. If you need 100 milligrams or more in a day, then it's a major mineral. Then the trace minerals, you have iron, zinc, copper, copper manganese, iodine, and selenium. So selenium is there's a there's only a fraction of a gram in your body, and you only need micrograms of every day, right? Maybe 50 micrograms. I recommend more than that, but let's say you need 50 micrograms of it a day. Well, if you don't get it, you are going to die, right? So so trace minerals are wickedly important. You just don't need a lot of them. Let's go through the major minerals now. So first we have sodium. Um, sodium is very important, right? Sodium gets demonized and we do consume too much of it, but you absolutely do need sodium. So even as much as people tell you to go on low salt diets and avoid sodium, we need we need 1,500 milligrams of it a day. So we still need one and a half grams of it every day. So it's the principal cation of extracellular fluid, and that's good and bad because it is the primary regulator of, of extracellular fluid volume. So if you eat a diet that's high in sodium, it's gonna suck water out of your cells and you're gonna have too much extracellular fluid. Well, that's gonna lead to edema and it's gonna lead to an increase in blood volume, which leads to an increase in blood pressure. So this is where a high sodium diet will lead to hypertension. Now you'll see that if you're trying to treat hypertension, you should also be dealing with the other end of it. You, you, need, you need to consume more electrolytes, more minerals that draw water into your cells. So I never recommend someone go on a low sodium diet. I recommend someone goes on a low sodium diet that's also higher in potassium and magnesium. All right, sodium plays a role in acid-base balance nerve transmission and muscle contraction, but the big one, nerve transmission, sodium is what depolarizes your nerves. Sodium basically turns nerves on, potassium turns them off, but sodium is also needed for muscle contraction. So it's demonized, but every muscle contraction, every nerve impulse, all these things rely on sodium. We just don't need so much of it, right? Our ancestors would have had a hard time finding sodium, right? They, if they lived, the, they needed to eat things from salt water, you know, live by salt marshes. There's actually a book called Salt, a hist world history. Wars were fought over salt because it was so hard to find, right? And now, now it's just not the case. So our ancestors craved salt and, and looked for it and ate it whenever they could because they should, because it was so hard to find. Now we consume way too much of it. We still have those kind of cravings built into, a, into our, our brains and our minds, but, um, but we don't, we, we, we consume too much of it now. So that's, that's a very, that used to be a very common pro or a very rare problem. Now it's very common. All right. Sodium travels freely in the blood. Kidneys filter out and return what is needed. So, okay. So sodium is important, but we want to make sure we're not getting too much of it. So let's look at, uh, remember, like I did with the vitamins, I got a few extra things I want to say here. Um, all right, so for sodium, what did I put there? I should have got this organized. All right, necessary for the maintenance of blood pressure, acid-base balance, muscle contractions, and nerve impulses, just like the book says. Uh, the adequate intake of 1,500 milligrams per day. Important for most people to consume less than 2,300 milligrams a day, which you see up here now. Um, people on low carbohydrate diets will need more sodium. That's because um, in, if your insulin levels drop, it also causes a drop in aldosterone. So you will reabsorb um, less sodium. That's why people that go on low carb diets, they recommend consuming more, more salt. Uh, let's see. The, the new Atkins diet and the Duke University Medical Center diet, which are both low carb diets, they both recommend you consume two cups of broth a day, which would be which would lead to almost two more grams of sodium, especially early on as your body is adapting to a lower carb diet. That's probably where you know the fluid loss and dehydration and loss of sodium is probably where some of the side effects from from trying a low carb diet come from. So it's just something to consider. 
Um, some people are more sensitive to excess sodium than others. Absolutely. I mean, genetically, about 30% of people are really salt sensitive. They'd be the ones where if they ate a high salt meal, their face would get puffy, their, their, they, their, their ankles would swell, they couldn't get their ring off. Those are people that are more salt sensitive. Most people are not. If you consume more salt, your body will just um, deal with it. The sta standard American diet can easily lead to 4,500 milligrams a day of sodium intake. You'll see the average up there is 3,400 milligrams, but can be higher than that. Uh, and that's mainly because of highly processed foods and canned goods. And it draws fluid out of your cells, leading to hypertension and edema. So I mentioned that. All right, now I have the FDA page here. We're looking at the sodium, right? Um, okay. So sodium, what does it do? Acid base balance, blood pressure regulation, fluid balance, muscle contraction, nerve function. Where is it found? Uh, we, uh, so the daily value here they have is 2,400 milligrams a day, but 2,300 is the one you hear most often. Um, bre breads and rolls, cheese, cold cuts and cured meats like deli packaged ham, mixed meat dishes like beef stew and chili, mixed pasta dishes like lasagna and spaghetti, pizza, poultry, sandwiches, Savory snacks like chips, crackers, popcorn, and pretzels, soups, and table salt. All right, um, so sodium deficiency is rare because like I said so easy to find. Um, high sodium leads to high blood pressure. Recommend an intake of 2,300 milligrams a day. Um, I think that it, as long as you're getting enough potassium and magnesium, you can consume more than that, but uh, uh, it's, it's definitely kind of a, a goal to shoot for. If you have hypertension, I recommend lowering sodium intake to that level and seeing what happens. The average sodium intake in the U.S. is 3,400 milligrams a day, uh, but I do. But again, I'm cautioning you: don't just lower your sodium. Get get the other. This is why just going on a lower salt diet diet doesn't make near, near as big of a difference as going on a diet that also is higher in the in the other electrolytes, potassium, and magnesium. Uh, salt, where do we get it? So table salt is sodium chloride, uh, and it does have the greatest effect on blood pressure. So the DASH diet. It's a very important diet. It's you know, designed by like 100 nutrition scientists um, to deal with hypertension. So DASH stands for the Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. It has been, there's different fit, different types of the DASH diet now, but it is a diet that's lower in sodium, um, you know, whole food diet basically, low sodium, high potassium, high magnesium, and it has been shown to drop blood pressure uh, uh, better than really any anything else I've seen besides medication. So if you have high blood pressure, I definitely recommend looking into the DASH diet, but just that's what it is. Um, it's got grains, fruits, veggies, leaner meats. So it's a, it's a lower sodium, higher potassium, higher magnesium diet. Sodium and bone losses. So uh, high salt intake does increase calcium excretion. So something to consider. But if you're also consuming potassium, you should be good. Uh, we talked about the DASH diet. Um, food sources of sodium. Processed foods have the most sodium. So basically, this is the double-edged sword because processed foods also reduce potassium. Really good chart coming up where I'll show you that. Um, fresh fruits and vegetables have the least sodium. So our ancestors would have ate food, like we need 4,700 milligrams of potassium a day, and then we only need 2,300 milligrams or so of sodium a day. Um, used to be easy to do because most foods that our ancestors ate would have been higher in potassium and lower in sodium. Now it's opposite. Let me see, I have it coming up here. Yeah, look at these chart, these charts here. When you process food, see, those, see how small those purple bars get? That's the potassium intake. And then when you, when you process foods, you often add salt. So you have like canned goods and packaged foods. They almost always add sodium. It, it, it preservative helps with flavor. So you see that processing, so before processing, food is high in potassium and low in sodium. After processing, food is high in sodium, low in potassium. This is why we've had this huge switch in our diet. So if you go back to eating less processed foods, more whole foods in their, in their closer to natural state, you'll, you'll cause that shift. So if you, have high, if you have high blood pressure, remember this image. Eating whole foods that are minimally processed will be one of the best ways that you can lower your sodium intake while increasing your potassium intake. So very, this is a really cool picture. I like this, this kind of snapshot here. All right, um, reflection, so pause if you need to. If sodium levels in the blood drop, you develop hyponatremia. Using an ultra-endurance athlete as an example, sweating causes losses in sodium and water. If too much water is consumed, the above condition develops. I mentioned that earlier, where you're losing water and electrolytes only replacing water, that can cause a dilution of the sodium in your blood and you can develop hyponatremia. Acute symptoms of excessive sodium on the other side then are edema and high blood pressure, two things that can be issues, but especially high blood pressure, that's just a straight up killer. 
All right, next one we're going to go through real quickly. Some of these are just that, you know, we, we consume so much table salt that getting chloride is not an issue. So it is essential, but I, I never think about it in the diet. Um, it's a major anion or negative ion of extracellular fluids. Moves passively across membranes. It's associated with sodium and potassium. So it does help maintain your fluid and electrolyte balance, and we also need it to make hydrochloric acid in our stomach. But uh, just because the average American consumes too much sodium, getting enough chloride in your diet, which comes from sodium chloride or table salt plus other places, uh, not a big deal. Usually, usually we're getting too much, uh, but, you're, but you're good there. Abundant and processed foods. Again, we need a lot of it, but we get a lot of it. Nothing really to talk about there. Um, deficiency in toxicity. Diets rarely lack chloride. Um, so you'd have to be losing it somehow, uh, mainly. And then toxicity would be caused by de serious dehydration, so don't do that. All right, potassium, another really, really big one. I love potassium. So it's a, uh, it's, it's, we need a lot of it and it's hard to get. And this is why it's one that we have to talk about quite a bit um, in a class like this because um, we need 4,700 milligrams of it a day and we don't have very much of it in our food. So I usually do a little thought experiment and you can do this. You go and Google, Google list of potassium rich foods or Google high potassium foods. Last time I did this, it took me to a, a website at the University of Michigan and add up the foods, add up the numbers. And then how many of these foods would you have to consume to get to 4,700 milligrams a day? Now we're talking about a single serving and you can certainly eat more, but usually it's between nine and 13 foods on a list of potassium rich foods. So Matt, you basically have to build your diet around getting enough potassium. And that's why I mentioned a few chapters ago that even people that eat really healthy diets have a, some nutrients they're gonna struggle to get. And the first three to come to mind are potassium, magnesium, and iodine. And um, potassium is, you know, is definitely one of them, right? You see, I have a potassium powder that I will use. I don't take very much of it, but um, let's see, I do about 350 milligrams of that every night before I go to bed, just to make sure I'm topping off my potassium tank. Because even if you're eating these foods that are high in potassium, 4,700 milligrams a day is a lot to get. And it's so important because it's your principal intracellular cation. So potassium is the main electrolyte that would suck water into your cells where you want it. So sodium is sucking water out of your cells. Potassium would suck the water back in. So, so if, you, if, if you decrease your sodium intake while increasing your potassium intake, you'll see a shift in where your body water is. And then hopefully you will have less um, blood plasma and you will have lower blood pressure if that's your goal, right? So roles in the body, it helps maintain fluid and electrolyte balance, just said why, helps maintain cell integrity, aids in nerve impulse transmission and muscle contraction. So whereas sodium turns nerves and muscles on, potassium turns nerves and, nerves and, nerves, uh, nerves and muscles off. Deficiencies, increase in blood pressure, that's the big one. Um, being Not having enough potassium makes you more salt sensitive, which makes sense because if you have less potassium holding water in your cells, then it won't take as much so sodium to suck it out of your cells. So if you're eating 2,300 milligrams of sodium and 4,700 milligrams of potassium, if they're in a tug of war, potassium will win and will suck more water into your cells, which is where it should be, right? Two thirds of your body water should be inside your cells. Uh, can lead to kidney stones, uh, bo increased bone turnover, irregular heartbeats, muscle weakness, and glucose intolerance, long list of things. So don't be deficient in potassium. If you're going to use chronometer or MyFitnessPal or any of these tools, one of the first things I want you looking at is your potassium intake and finding ways to bump that up, which you can see here. All right, let's look at some foods. Um, okay. So potassium, nutrient of concern for most Americans. That's what the FDA site says. Blood pressure regulation, carbohydrate metabolism, fluid balance, growth and development, heart function, muscle contraction, nervous system function, and protein formation. So we need, again, I recommend shooting for 4,700 milligrams a day. Um, bananas, beet greens, juices like carrot, pomegranate, prune, orange, and tomato juice. Uh, but remember, a lot of those will have sodium too. So you want, you want to go with like a, maybe like a low sodium B8, for example, would have way more potassium than sodium. Milk, oranges and orange juice, potatoes and sweet potatoes. We always think about bananas, but like a potato is going to have way more potassium than a banana. Um, prunes and prune juice, spinach, tomatoes and tomato products, white beans and yogurt. Yogurt's another really good source of potassium. All right, potassium here on my document works with sodium to maintain fluid balance, blood pressure, muscle contraction, and nerve impulses, draws water into your cells where two thirds of it is supposed to be, lowering your blood pressure. 
uh, recommendation of 4,700 milligrams a day. The standard American diet is usually low in potassium, and some studies show that less than 10% of Americans are getting enough of it. Some studies show that 1.5% of Americans are getting enough potassium every day. Best food sources are fruits and vegetables of all kinds. Um, well under 5% of Americans eat enough vegetables, also found in, in beef liver. And then again, you've got yeah your yogurts, potatoes, bananas, the typical things you see. And look at this list here. So look at these foods. How many of them are you eating, and are you getting enough potassium? These, these AIs, remember, these are the floor, right? These, these are small numbers. This is the absolute minimum you should be getting. That 4,700 milligrams is what I recommend as an optimal number. So you see here the AI for men, 3,400 milligrams a day. For women, 2,600 milligrams. All right, pause and see if you can answer these. Potassium is abundant in all cells. Processing destroys cells. Therefore, fresh foods are the richest sources of potassium. So I showed you that chart earlier. Potassium has an AI of 4,700 milligrams a day, and that's a number I trust way better than any of the small numbers. Diets low in potassium raise blood pressure. To meet potassium needs, people are recommended to consume more fresh fruits and vegetables, which is why the average American does not get enough potassium. Okay, calcium. Keep checking the clock because I got a class here. I apologize. Uh, calcium is the most abundant mineral in the body. Uh, we need it. It's primarily for our skeleton, our bones, and our teeth. So adequate intake grows a healthy skeleton in early life, which is good because that that's uh, you're going to build uh, your peak bone density. So as you get older, you lose bone density. But if you start from a higher peak, you'll probably never get to osteoporosis. So it helps minimize bone loss in later life. Majority of body's calcium is found in your bones and teeth. It's part of your bone structure, and that's where we store minerals, right? Your bones are basically like a mineral storage depot. Calcium in body fluids. So what else does it do? This is a, one, a really important point, though. Um, you know, you when you think calcium, you think bones, and that's fine. But your body has your the main the main reason your body stores calcium in bones, besides building your skeleton, is so that it has access to it when it needs it. Because calcium does lots of things. So having strong bones in your 80s is the last thing your body cares about when it comes to calcium. Because look at all these things that it does. Helps to maintain blood pressure. It participates in blood clotting, so calcium is needed for the blood clotting process. Calcium, that's outside of your cells. Inside of your cells, it's needed for every muscle contraction, every nerve impulse. So um, <clears throat> calcium is what allows your muscle fibers to actually grab onto each other. It, it, it removes the shielding protein out of the way, so your actin and myosin, your thin and thick filaments, can grab and pull on each other. Um, transmission of nerve impulses, so calcium is needed to secrete neurotransmitters so the, into the synapses so your nerves can actually accomplish something. Uh, calcium is needed to secrete hormones. It's called a uh, second messenger. Um, activation of some enzyme reactions. So you see calcium is wickedly important. So your body says, okay, do I want to keep your bones strong for later or keep your heart beating now? And it always chooses that. So think about it that way. Every day you're not getting enough calcium. Either you're not eating it enough of it or not absorbing enough of it. Your bones are going to get weaker because your body will go and steal that calcium from your bones. All right. Um, so calcium balance, very complicated. I've gone through all this in some other videos, but uh, um, you have, you see here, we have hormones, we have calcitonin and parathyroid hormone are kind of uh, balance each other out. So calcitonin is a, is the hormone that, um, <clears throat> that will um, cause calcium to be driven, you know, kept, keep it in your blood and, or cause it to be driven from your blood into your body tissues. Parathyroid hormone will stimulate the ca uh, calcium to be taken out of your bones. You see down here, uh, let's just start at the top. If you have high blood calcium, that signals the thyroid gland to secrete calcitonin. Calcitonin inhibits the activation of vitamin D, so you don't reabsorb more of it. You don't want too much calcium in your blood either. So it also prevents calcium reabsorption in the kidneys. So if you have too much calcium in your blood, you basically will, will try to reabsorb less and, and excrete more in your urine. It also limits calcium absorption in the kidneys and then inhibits osteoclasts. Osteoclasts are the bone cells that break uh, minerals out, break calcium out of your bones. So inhibits osteoclast cells from breaking down bone, preventing the release of calcium. And the end result, this is homeostasis 101, the end result is lower blood calcium and then calcitonin will drop. Uh, on the other side, which is more common if the average person isn't eating enough calcium or is vitamin D deficient, Low blood calcium will signal the parathyroid gland, those little, those two paired glands, those red glands there behind the thyroid, signal the parathyroid glands to secrete parathyroid hormone into the blood. So what does it do? Um, parathyroid hormone stimulates the activation of vitamin D, which vitamin D stimulates calcium reabsorption from the kidneys and also enhances calcium absorption in the intestines. 
Parathyroid hormone also stimulates calcium reabsorption from the kidneys directly as well. So parathyroid hormone and vitamin D are both going to reabsorb more calcium from the kidneys, while uh, all, and then vitamin D will also increase calcium absorption in the gut. Okay, then they also both stimulate osteoclasts. So osteoclasts are the bone cells that break down bone. Osteoblasts build new bone. Osteoclasts break down bone to release the calcium into the bloodstream. And the end result is blood calcium goes up and then that parathyroid hormone would go back down. So that's how your body maintains calcium balance. But notice where it cares about. It cares about blood calcium. Bone, bone calcium levels are great. They're a luxury, but your body is really only concerned about keeping you alive for the next couple of minutes and then the next couple of minutes, then the next couple of minutes, right? So, so whether or not you have osteoporosis off in the future is not your body's priority. Maintaining blood calcium levels today is. All right, um, let me read this point here about calcitonin at the bottom. Calcitonin plays a major role in defending infants and young children against the dangers of rising blood calcium that can occur when regular feedings of milk deliver large quantities of calcium to a small body. In contrast, calcitonin plays a relatively minor role in adults because their absorption of calcium is less efficient and their bodies are larger, making elevated blood calcium unlikely. So calcitonin is better at helping you build bone when you're younger than when you're older, which is why when we get older, even if we do all the right things, you're generally not going to be building a bunch of new bone. Um, as someone in your 40s, 50s, 60s, beyond, your priority is slowing bone loss, not building new bone, especially like once you have osteoporosis. Maintaining your bones and keeping the protein portion of your bones as strong as possible is the priority. You're no, you're just, you, you're, you can't turn back the clock that far when it comes to bone density. And part of that is because calcitonin is just not that effective in adults. All right, calcium in disease prevention. So calcium can help with hypertension. We don't talk about that much, but it, but it can. Um, plays roles in blood cholesterol levels, diabetes, uh, colon cancer, kind of a neat one. Uh, again, not completely proven yet, but, but it appears that um, a, a, a diet high in calcium can um, decrease the conversion of colon polyps to cancerous lesions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, calcium may play a role in obesity and help prevent or uh, maintain a healthy body weight, but osteoporosis is a big one. So reaching peak bone mass means denser bones protect against inevitable age-related bone loss and fractures. So like I mentioned, if you start from a higher peak, two people, they're both going to lose bone density throughout life, but the one that started with a higher peak is hopefully never going to reach osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is silent because the body shows no symptoms. You don't, you generally don't, unless you get a DEXA scan and x-rays and these kind of things, you don't know you have osteoporosis until something goes wrong, right? Until you have a fracture, for example. And these are life-threatening conditions, right? There is, um, I was involved in a study uh, when, when I was younger that found that 82% of people that fracture their hip because of osteoporosis never go home again. Fall kills them, die, die of pneumonia in the hospital, have to live in a long-term care facility forever or have to live with families. These are life-threatening, life-altering problems. So if you're listening to me right now and you're 20 years old, worry about your bone density now because you're going to worry about it when you're 70 and it's going to be too late. Not too late to do anything, but but you, you can make a much bigger um, impact today. Okay. Calcium recommendations. So hormones maintain blood concentrations regardless of dietary intake. And that's why, like it says there, when intake is low, bones suffer. Any day you don't get enough calcium digest or you know, eaten, digested, and absorbed, your bones will suffer. Every day you, that you eat, if you if you're not eating enough calcium today, your bones are gonna get a little tiny bit weaker. And they're gonna a little bit tiny, little tiny bit weaker tomorrow, et cetera, et cetera. So recommendations are set high enough to accommodate a 30% average absorption rate because when you get older, calcium absorption is really rough. Just calcium isn't absorbed very well anyways, but you need a lot of stomach acid to digest it, et cetera, et cetera. So 1,300 milligrams a day for adolescents, 1,000 milligrams a day for adults up to the age of 50, and then 1,200 milligrams a day for women over 50 and everyone over 70. And then of course, this doesn't work, right? You need, you need. I was just gonna say, vitamin D is gonna be a big thing here. Um, make if you're vitamin D deficient, then the calcium you are eating won't be absorbed. So you do, you do need to make sure you have enough of the other nutrients um, in play. How does calcitonin affect vitamin D in the kidneys? We already went through that. Calcitonin is released when blood calcium is high. If vitamin D is not activated, calcium reabsorption in the kidneys is prevented. Parathyroid hormone stimulates vitamin D activation. This increases calcium absorption in the intestines. Osteoclast cells, osteoclast cells release calcium into the blood and parathyroid hormone raises blood calcium levels. So we covered that all with that chart. 
All right, phosphorus, gonna go through it real quickly. Very important, very easy to find. So because it's, it's, it's a structural component of cell membranes, anytime you're eating cells, you're eating phosphorus. So the second most abundant mineral in the body, hydroxyapatite crystals, so it helps form the hydroxyapatite crystals of bone and teeth. So when we think of calcium, we think of bones, right, and teeth, but phosphorus is needed to make what's called hydroxyapatite, which is actually what allows your bones and teeth to mineralize. So we need it, need lots of it. Um, it's part of your major phosphorus buffering system to maintain body pH. It's parts of both DNA and RNA. It assists in energy metabolism, right? We have adenosine triphosphate, uh, so phosphates are needed for that. Um, we can't build ATP without phosphates or phosphorus. Um, helps transport lipids in the blood and a structural component of cell membranes. So, so I'm not trying to downplay phosphorus. It's just that, again, getting enough of it is not generally a concern. So deficiency are unlikely as long as you're getting enough protein. And you know how I feel about protein, right? I think the RDA is absolutely the floor, the bare minimum that someone should be consuming. And most people should be consuming more of it. So that the kind of diet I recommend that prioritizes protein means that phosphorus should not be a concern at all. Um, the upper limit is 4,000 milligrams. Very, toxicity is very rare. Unless, of course, look down here, you're consuming a whole lot of liver. So that's why I, don't, I never recommend someone consume more than a pound of liver a week. That might even be too much. But I love liver, but uh, it's so nutrient dense, you want to make sure you're not overdoing it. It's pretty rare that we have foods that are maybe too good for you, but um, I think that um, beef liver can be an example of that. All right, magnesium. Another really important one that we often don't get enough of. So I mentioned earlier that even someone on a really healthy diet um, may, may be struggling to get that 4,700 milligrams of potassium. Well, same thing with magnesium. Magnesium is found in green leafy vegetables and all these kind of things. But So even someone eating a healthy diet may not be achieving optimal levels. And that's because magnesium is really important in ATP production. So if you're eating really healthy, but let's say you're an athlete and you're, you know, you're, you're using a lot of energy, your magnesium needs will be higher. So magnesium is also one of them where even on a really healthy diet, make sure you're getting enough of it and possibly supplement with it, which I do. So this is not an advertisement for now foods. I just happen to be sitting by my, my supplements. So I take uh, 400 milligrams of that um, once a day besides all the magnesium I get from green leafy vegetables, etc. Okay, not medical advice, not sales, just uh, that's we're friends here and that's what I do. All right, so body locations. More than half the magnesium is found in your bones. When you think about bones, you think of calcium, but bones are just a mineral storage depot. There's manganese and molybdenum and all sorts of stuff in there. Uh, it's a, a reservoir to ensure normal blood concentrations. So again, what's, what's the real function of your bones? If you don't eat enough magnesium the day, we can, you, your body can go into your bones to get it. It keeps you from dying from not getting enough minerals in your diet. So what is magnesium for? hundreds of things, right? There are at least 300 processes in your body that are powered by magnesium. Magnesium is the, is the cofactor that powers the enzymes for at least 300 functions. And basically magnesium deficiency is linked to pretty much every chronic disease that, that the modern human deals with. So rolls, maintains bone health, necessary for energy metabolism, uh, catalysts in ATP production, that's what I mentioned before, really critical roles in ATP production. Another really big one is it's it's needed for um, protecting our DNA. So the enzymes that um, that proofread and protect and, and um, deal with mutations in our DNA are magnesium dependent. So magnesium is needed to generate energy and to protect your DNA. That should be all the reason that you need, you need to make sure you're getting enough of it. Inhibits muscle contraction and blood clotting when you don't want those things to occur and supports normal function of the immune system. So super, super important. Um, all right, so what did I put about magnesium here? Because again, it is one of my faves. Magnesium, this is a very, I have it in all caps, a very important nutrient that the huge majority of Americans are deficient in. It plays a role in the functioning of at least 300 enzyme systems. Good food sources include green leafy vegetables, beef liver, and nuts. Magnesium glycinate is my favorite supplemental form because it doesn't lead to um, the GI issues. Because if you've ever had a bowel prep for a colonoscopy, they use magnesium to cause to flush out your colon. Uh, magnesium glycinate is way less likely to do that. Magnesium deficiencies seem to increase your risk of every disease of civilization or modern disease that we talked about there. Magnesium, uh, the FDA site here, blood pressure regulation, blood sugar regulation, bone formation, energy production, hormone secretion, immune function, muscle contraction, nervous system function, normal heart rhythm, protein formation. You get the point. Where is it found? So we need the 400 milligrams a day. Where is it found? Avocados, bananas, beans and peas, dairy products, green leafy vegetables like spinach, 
nuts and pumpkin seeds, potatoes, raisins, wheat bran, and whole grains. All right, uh, back to magnesium, that was pretty cool. So we look at um, iron, right? Iron sits in the center of hemoglobin, which transports oxygen in our body. Magnesium does that with chlorophyll. So magnesium is like the iron of the plant world, and that's why when you eat green leafy vegetables, you, you consume the magnesium, just like when you eat um, red meat, you consume the iron. So look at the, so you see here, average dietary intake for US adults is below recommendations. Look at this list of foods and how few of them, other than halibut, even reaches over 100 milligrams a day. So you, ha you have to eat a ton of foods that have a little bit of magnesium to reach those RDAs that we're shooting for, right? That ball, you know, around the, around the 400 milligram um, a day recommendation. Hard water does contribute, but most people use water softeners, so that's, that's, that limits it there as well. Um, sources, legumes, seeds, nuts, and leafy green veggies, and I already explained why. All right, magnesium deficiency and toxicity. Deficiency rarely occurs as far as o overt disease, but we already mentioned the average American's not getting enough, which means that it's either harvesting it from your um, bones or there are deficiencies. So how your body works is, okay, I have to keep making ATP or I'm gonna die. So I'll, I'll focus our magnesium on ATP production, which means I don't have as much ma magnesium for DNA protection, right? So that, and then over time, does that mean you're accumulating more mutations? P possibly. So overt deficiencies would cause tetany and impaired central nervous system activity, uh, can play a role in hypertension, which I already talked about. If you're eating more potassium and more magnesium while eating less sodium, then you'll have a fluid shift and then hopefully you'll have a decreased blood volume and blood pressure. Toxicity uh, can be fatal, but if it, you know, again, if it, if it happens, we're talking really high dose supplementation. And then sulfate. Um, sulfate is going to be found in, you know, it's in any of your sulfur-based amino acids, which are methionine and cysteine. So again, if you're eating, if you're consuming protein, like I recommend, you won't have to worry about this. So no recommended intake. Just make sure you're getting enough protein, and you'll have sulfate. Not downplaying its importance, but it's just one. I don't like to spend a lot of time talking about nutrients that we just don't have to worry about finding. Okay, we are here. So now, so explain how the body regulates fluid balance. We did that. List some of the ways minerals differ from vitamins and other nutrients. Did that. Remember, organic, inorganic, found in the soil, etc. Identify the main roles, deficiency symptoms, and food sources for each of the major minerals. Sodium, chloride, potassium, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, sulfate. We hit all those. All right, so we have one more to finish up this unit. We have one more video on the trace minerals, and then we will move on to kind of uh, like nutrition across the lifespan, and we'll start to put it all together. All right, so now we've been through, here's the macronutrients, Here's the micronutrients, here's water, right? These are the things we build a human with. Now let's look at what our needs are at different times in our lives. Okay, I hope this helps. Have a wonderful day. Be blessed.